Hello, hello. Welcome to the Affordability in Private Education webinar. My name is Jennifer Webb and I am the Director of Enrollment Management and Financial Aid here at Flint Hill. And we are so delighted that all of you are joining us for this webinar today. And I'll turn it over to my other two colleagues here with us today to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dawn Hopke. I am, work here in the admission team at Flint Hill and I'm look, looking forward to talking with you today. Oh, Jordy, I think you're muted. I am, so sorry about that. Um, my name is Jordy Izzard and I'm an admission officer here at Flint Hill and I will be your moderator for the webinar. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat function and ask them and I may type answers back or we may uh, say them verbally as well and enjoy. Great, thank you both. Do do both of does everyone see the presentation on the screen right now? Yes. Great, great. Thank you, thank you so much. So uh, first, we'll go over um, what you can expect from our presentation today. And so some of the things that we will cover today are ways to afford private school, uh, the value of a private education, and then next steps with Flint Hill specifically. So I'd love to hear from all of you. Um, if there's one of these that you'd like to, to hear about most more than the others, so let's label uh, ways to afford private school one, the value of a private education as two, and then next steps with Flint Hill as three. And then if you'll just go ahead and practice Practice using your chat function and type in the numbers that you're most interested in hearing about. It might be one, two, three, it might be a one, it might be three. Yes, we'll make the slides, we'll make a webinar, the webinar recording available uh, to all attendees and all registrants after the event. Great, great. Thank you so yeah, much for sending in the response. We have a raised response. hand. Wonderful. We have a raised hand from Carla Marie. Okay. Carla, feel free to chat in your question or unmute yourself and, and just ask away. Sorry about the mute. No okay. questions. One for me, though. Ways to afford a private school. Jordy, did, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. Jordy, did you catch it? I did not. If you could just repeat the question, Carla, we're happy to answer. Sorry about that. Oh, well, no question. I was saying just number one for me. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. It looks like I see the responses. We have a, a great mix. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. And we'll go ahead and we will jump right in. Um, there are uh, with the the ways to afford private school. That's where we're, we're starting today. So um, there are several ways to afford private school that I've listed on the screen. And these are some of the ones that we're gonna go over. Payment plans, financial aid, loans and credit cards, scholarships, um, family and community support, college savings that can be used for private school, five to nine accounts um, and, and ways to save. So uh, Dawn's gonna get us started now with getting on a payment plan. Absolutely. And so one of our first options is, is that payment plan option. So paying the entire year's tuition is only maybe maybe a little bit of a, a much for a family as you consider your, your budget. And one thing you can do to make that easier is to request a payment plan from, from the school that you eventually consider and enroll in. Many private schools will allow you to get on payment plans. On such plans, you'll be allowed to make smaller payments instead of that one lump sum. Um, you'll be able to set up a schedule that is um, allows you to budget in consideration of the, the other expenses that you have in your, your financial obligations in your household. Um, so here at Flint Hill, we offer... Uh, Three different types of payment plans. One is, of course, that lump sum that that um, we've talked about. Um, other is a either a a twice a year or a ten month payment plan um, that allows those installments to meet, be made over a period of time. Um, and one tip for you is to to learn more about tuition um, when you're considering the, your private schools and what's included in that tuition. Are fees included, and what are those payment uh, plans that are what options are there available to you? So it's a key question to ask when you're going through the admission process. 
Thank you, Don. And so next we'll talk about a financial aid. So whether to apply, where to apply, types of aid, when to apply, uh, all those questions that tend to come up when a family thinks about financial aid. So many private schools do offer financial aid um, and financial aid applications, they estimate how much a family could reasonably contribute toward the tuition. So they're taking a look at and analyzing income, expenses, assets, debts, the age of parents, family size, education costs, whether college or private school for, for other family members. And one of the questions that we get very commonly, um, is there a specific income cutoff? Like how much, under how much do you have to make to qualify for aid? And as you can tell by all of the factors that I just listed, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, so we can't prescribe a specific cutoff for any one of the factors because all of those different things interact together. For example, a family could have a very high income amount, but their expenses could be high. They could be taking care of both parents. They could have a couple kids in college. Um, whereas a family with the lower income um, could have less expenses. So it really is a lot more than just income. So um, what schools will typically look at when they're offering aid is what is that gap between what the cost of the tuition and what the family can reasonably afford based on their income and expenses in order to cover the tuition. So if you're trying to decide whether to apply, um, the bottom line really is that if you can't fully afford to pay the cost of tuition, then it might be worth it to submit a financial aid application. Something else to, to know, and of course this varies a little bit from school to school, so you'll want to talk to each of the schools that you're applying to, um, but often schools that do offer need-based financial aid like Flint Hill, it doesn't mean that they will provide the gap coverage or financial aid for that, that gap to all families that demonstrate need. So demonstrating need does not um, equal will be awarded aid. So as families are kind of preparing for this and thinking about all the factors that we'll talk about today, um, it's really great to, to, to keep that in mind. As uh, here at Flint Hill, we do receive a lot more requests for awards than um, from people that do demonstrate need than awards available. With that said, we do have about 20% of our um, enrolled families are receiving some type of financial aid. There is something else that we do here at Flint Hill, and um, again, it varies school to school, but it's, it's something to think about and something to ask. Uh, in the cases where a family has demonstrated financial need, but we um, do not have the funding in order to cover that need, we have something called an aid wait pool. So um, we will put families on an aid wait pool in the um, event, which is sometimes a little bit unlikely, the unlikely event that um, aid does become available. So um, think about when you're receiving information from admissions offices, um, for our office, the admission decision and the financial aid decision are made by two different groups of people, and they are completely independent of each other. So a family can be offered admission and then either awarded aid, not awarded aid because need isn't um, determined to be to exist or placed in the aid wait pool. Um, it could be some of the, the combinations between the admission decision and the financial aid decision. Um, and so when you're so if you determine that, you, you know, you would really need some support, we're going to cover a lot of ways to get support. But if you determine that you'll need support to make the, the tuition work and you decide that you want to apply, uh, most of the applications do open on November 1st. And for us, that's our fast application that becomes available on our tuition and financial aid website. Um, it stands for Financial Aid for School Tuition, um, F-A-S-T. And so that link pops up on November 1st on our website, and then you can um, apply there. There's other schools that also use a FAST. There's the FACS system. Um, there's a few different systems out there. So you'll want to ask each school that you're applying to what their system is and what their time line is. 
And so we covered uh, that at, at Flint Hill, we are all need-based financial aid. And so, um, and that that is a common type of financial aid that, that schools will award and need does need to be demonstrated. Some schools do offer merit scholarships um, and they're re is typically reserved for students who have some type of special talent that the school is seeking out, such as art, music, academics, what, whatever else they might identify for the merit scholarship. And sometimes those merit scholarships are awarded once and sometimes they're ongoing annually. Um, so those are some questions to, to ask as you're learning about those from schools. In terms of Flint Hills need-based financial aid, we do have asked families to, to apply every year so that we are getting that great picture um, of their of their financial um, the financial picture. And so we ask that they apply every year. Typically, unless there's been some drastic change in finances, either up or down, um, maybe a hardship or maybe um, came into income some way, um, aid typically stays the same. And it usually has to be a pretty significant jump up or down in order for the award to change. It wouldn't be like a raise or a typical annual bonus um, that, that's moderate. Um, it would have to be some, some big change in order for, for us to change that typically. A lot of families, there's um, there's a lot of myths out there about financial aid and NAIS, the National Association of Independent Schools, lists on their website. If you search NAIS and myths about financial aid, you'll come to a great website that helps demystify some of the myths that are out there by about financial aid. One of them is that if you apply for financial aid, that might hurt your, your child's chances of being admitted. Like I said, at Flint Hill, that's certainly not the case because we make those admission decisions separate from those financial aid decisions. And so next we'll talk a little bit more, um, go into the, the timeline, specifically how it fits, how financial aid fits into the overall timeline of the admission process. And so I have our admission, some of our key admission dates up on the screen, along with some of the key financial aid dates up on the screen. And again, you want to check with every school. Most of the ones that are members of AISGW, the associ association, excuse me, of um, the schools in greater Washington do follow the same or a very similar timeline. So our application is already open for admission. I know a lot of you have, have applied, so that's wonderful. So great to, to see you here today. Um, I'm sure some of you will are, are yet to apply, but will, and, and we certainly are excited about that. And then November 1st, as I mentioned, marks the opening of the financial aid deadline. The 25th is when the financial aid application is due. March 5th is when admission decisions are sent out and aid decisions, even though they're made by two different groups, those go out together. So you'll learn about your admission decision and your financial aid decision all at the same time. And then there's um, some other key dates in the admission process there. And if you're interested in learning more about the admission process specifically, we did a webinar a couple of weeks ago called Navigating the Private School Admission Process. And that recording is on our website. Okay, and I will turn it over to Dawn to talk about loans and credit cards. Thanks, Jennifer. So just like you can take out a loan for a new house or a new car, you can take out a loan for private school tuition. You should also take a look at your finances and determine whether you're willing to take on that long-term debt. If you think you might be able to pay off the loan before the term ends, then make sure there are no penalties involved with that early payment. So many lenders do have those penalties in place that, that kick in if you try to pay off early. So that's definitely a research point for, for you if this is a consideration. Um, you can certainly learn more about you know, uh, resources for ex expenses associated with a private school education from Sally May. Um, but again, you're gonna wanna do that research to find the best lender or loan option for your family. Tuition loans are personal loans. They are, they are provided by a private lender. You have to apply directly to that lender and your loan amount in in interest rates will depend on um, certainly the lender's credit requirements. 
Some loans are used to pay expenses or, or, and not covered by grant. You can search for lenders who offer K-12 loans on NAIS, National Association of Independent Schools. They do have a company and consultant directory that could be helpful to you. And you're going to want to select the financial aid loan programs when you do that search in that category field. Now, Flint Hill does have a loan program. We've partnered with an educational loan program called Tuition Solution. Um, they work with families to offer a low fixed education plan, a low fixed rate education plan. Another alternative to, you know, um, to sort of looking at the, the, the payment options are credit cards. And many private schools do uh, allow you to make your tuition payments using a credit card. However, you're going to want to look at a, a card that might, you know, offer that, that money back option um, or offer some sort of rewards to you. Some credit card companies offer anywhere from 1% to 5% cash back on purchases made. And if you have such a card, then you'll get a significant amount of money back if you charge your private school tuition payments. One of the things you're going to want to think about carefully, though, is um, if you're not able to pay that balance off right away, then pay, you'll be paying that interest and that'll eliminate any of the cash back benefits that you would have earned through using that credit card. You're also going to want to ask questions about um, the credit card fees um, related to, to using that credit card for payment. Um, you know, families at Flint Hill are able to participate in the FACTS program. That is not the, the FAST program. This is F-A-C-T-S, which is uh, an automated payment plan, which uses Discover, MasterCard, Visa, and American Express to charge you know, your credit card or your, your tuition payments. And there is a convenience fee um, to that of about 2.85% or $100 processes in addition to the fax fee. So um, definitely ask questions about those using that credit card and learn all you can about any additional fees related to, to that using that credit card to, to pay tuition. Great. Thank you, Don. And one thing I'll I'll add is that um, we talked about the the payment plans uh, with even without using a credit card is also our fax system. Um, just to keep it really confusing with the fax and the fast. Um, but the if you you pay using a checking account or another type of bank account, there isn't the same fees as if you uh, pay with a, a credit card. Okay, and to move on to talk about scholarships, um, a lot of families will seek out a private school scholarships. Uh, many families tend to think about scholarships as financial aid tools only available for college students, but there's actually a lot available to help fund kindergarten through 12th grade education. <clears throat> Excuse me. For families sending their children to independent schools, the National Association of Independent Schools, NACE, offers a financial aid guide that might help. On the AISG, also AISGW offers a guide on their website too. If you go to AISGW.com backslash affordability, you'll find that one there. So you can search for, for both of those to get a full current updated listing of scholarships that, that are out there. A number of the scholarships do aim to specifically support children from low income families or other groups. Some might be merit based. Another really great resource out there is FinAid, F-I-N, Aid, where they list scholarships that may help fund your child's private education. And they have a list of scholarships for children under the age of 12. Just a couple of examples of them. There's there's some up on your, your screen. Uh, the Grants to Individual Foundation, uh, among among others, grant students in university or graduate programs scholarships to students pursuing an education at a private secondary education um, institution. Working with a great uh, aspiration scholarship program, also known as GRASP, is a nonprofit program dedicated to helping students and families obtain funding for education. They'll help assist you with financial aid process and even award and administer scholarships. 
There is the Jack Cook, uh, Kent Cook Foundation that awards tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships to students entering high school who have de demonstrated strong academic performance and family need, which they define as having a family income of no more than $95,000 a year. The Jack Kent Cook Foundation offers scholarships on the basis of both need and merit. So there's that need um, that needs to be demonstrated, but then they also take merit into consideration for high schoolers for part of its Young Scholars program. And you can think about these programs depending on where you are in the process as well. Uh, for the Jack Kent Cook Foundation, it's a tongue twister, they um, the families start the application process in grade seven. So something to, to think about there. There's Emerging Scholars as a comprehensive 14 month program of academic, cultural and social preparation program. Emerging Scholars partners with parents and institutions such as Flint Hill to provide significant financial, academic and social support, which allows unique, capable and driven students to embrace the life changing opportunities of enrolling at an independent school. And their website is emergingscholars.org. If you want to cast a, a wider net, there's a number of middle and high school scholarships and awards that take other criteria into consideration. For example, the Gloria Baron Prize for Young Heroes awards up to 10,000 to those students between age eight and 18 who have demonstrated a dedication to their community through a service project. There's a Team America Rocketry Challenge, um, which awards a total of $100,000 to middle and high school students who demonstrate excellence through a model rocket contest. So you, just to give a, a few examples of the type of scholarships that are out there, but really searching some of those resources on the, the right tier screen um, or some of the ones that I listed earlier are going to help you find the ones that are best match for, you, for your child, for their interests, for, for their talents, and where you are are in your, your journey to a private school program. Another consideration that we see a lot of families here at Flint Hill do is when you're thinking about pursuing private education is to think about family and community support. Uh, while it can initially seem awkward to ask for help, extended family can be a truly excellent resource of tuition assistance. Many grandparents, aunts, uncles, and other family members spend significant sums of money on their young relatives for toys, clothes, fun experiences. Instead, some families suggest they channel this willingness to give to contribute to something that is longer lasting and can pro provide something of, of lasting value, such as a private school education. So families can give the option of assisting with private school tuition in the lieu of holiday or birthday gifts. Uh, family or community members can help free up some of the, the funds for the family. And a lot of times these, these gifts can help cover some of the expenses that support private school enrollment, whether it's a transportation cost, such as bus transportation to the, the school, club fees, textbooks, uniforms, um, and, and other costs that, that can add up. Switching over to, to, to ways to save, um, often families afford private education by combining a variety of the ways discussed up until this point. If paying for private school tuition is going to leave you financially stretched, then you'll want to, of course, sit down with a detailed budget that not only includes financial obligations such as debts and mortgage payments that you're responsible for, but also your cost of living expenses such as utilities, groceries, gas, entertainment. And odds are when you take a, a close look at your budget and there's a lot of great tools out there that you'll be able to reduce some of your, your expenses and find some wiggle room to, to help cover some private school tuition. You want to draw attention to, to cutting expenses. Um, some common examples of places that families will look to, to save some money are uh, stop eating out as much, getting delivery services, look to see how food costs, such a big cost for us, can, can be reduced. Um, looking at subscription and app services to see if there's any that they can decrease or, or remove. Um, buying things in bulk, looking at ways to, to save um, save gas and transportation, such as carpooling, using public transportation, also great ways to, to support the environment too. 
cut down on, on entertainment costs, um, looking to have at-home movie nights instead of going out to the movies, for example, um, thinking um, through a lot of these, and of course, consulting with a financial advisor um, to think about ways that you might be able to save or reduce costs for uh, allocating that to private education. There's a lot of really great um, financial blogs or podcasts out there where listening to, to it once a week or, or whatever your routine is can really help you think about how you can, can save money and, and reallocate funds um, for, for priorities like private school. Okay. Another, um, before I move on a little bit to, to talk about some of the college savings accounts, another thing to discuss with your financial advisor, um, if you're, you're able to meet with one or do some, um, do some research on your own is there's a few, there's a lot of tax credits out there. So there's a few States, including DC and Maryland that offer government provided aid that allows parents to use public funds to pay for private school tuition. The assistance ranges from tax credits, which reimburse you for some of the expenses, to vouchers that can cover some of the private school tuition costs. Um, there's a program called the Education Improvement Scholarship Tax Credit in Virginia that was enacted by the Education Improvement Scholarships Tax Credits Program. And this program offers a 65% tax credit to individual individuals and businesses that donate to qualified scholarship foundations. And then the scholarship foundations provide private school scholarships to students whose families meet the income requirements. So please visit their website for more information about the tax credit scholarship programs funding, the eligibility and the, the regulations. Another great resource is the Department of Education website um, to, to learn more about those types of savings as well. There's also some state voucher. Um, there's other state voucher and, and credit tax credit programs out there, of course. Um, you'll want to look at your state and, and see what they offer. There's the American Federation for Children um, that provides information about tax credits and voucher programs. Also, EdChoice has a listing of educational savings accounts, school vouchers, tax credits, scholarships, individual tax credits. Um, and then again, the, the Department of Education SOAR, uh, site is a great resource. So another way to think about funding private school education is if you've already set up or thinking about setting up a Coverdell education savings account or a 529, depending on, on where you are. If you're way ahead of thinking about private education or uh, maybe you've already started one of these accounts and you're, you're thinking about private education immediately, um, these types of accounts receive key tax advantages also. So many parents set up a college savings account as they're typically thought of early in life to, to think about using um, the funds for college education. But these accounts can also be used to cover private school tuition and expenses. And these tax benefits can um, to the for these accounts can offer significant family savings as well. All money deposited into the investment account grows tax deferred, meaning that funds in the account can be withdrawn with no tax benefit penalty to pay for any qualified education expenses, which include private school tuition, books, and uniforms typically. So there's a great tool to compare the Coverdell ESA with the 529 plan to get a better understanding of which option may be best for you. And so if you search like Coverdell ESA versus 529 um, and savings for college, there's a website that will bring up a comparison of the, the two. And so, um, so of course, you'll want to consider this option as you're considering balancing eventually paying for college also. We are a private uh, prep, uh, college prep school, so that uh, college tuition will, will come along too. So it's really a family decision. Um, some families believe that investing in private education um, could help their, their student be more competitive for college financial aid and, and tuition support. Um, some families may um, 
may know that later in life they'll have less expenses or that they'll have more income for a variety of reasons. Some family have grandparents or other family members that are already investing to these accounts. Um, and they know that they might be able to utilize that and use some of their own funding later for, for college. So it's really um, a, a family decision and in, in how you're going to use these college, um, typically thought of as college savings funds uh, for a private education. Okay. And so next, um, naturally, as you are thinking about a private education, one of the things that probably comes up for you as you're thinking through all of these expenses is, is it worth it, right? <laughs> as you look at the tuition and you're looking at the, the expense, like, is it worth it? And so again, that's going to be a, a family reflection uh, in that navigating private school admission process, we talk quite a bit about, you know, determining fit and determining if private school is the right fit for you. And, and if so, what private schools might be the, the right fit. So um, some of the, the considerations, um, of course, at Flint Hill, we think that private education is certainly worth it, um, as do our, our enrolled families. And some of the things that families will look at when they're considering um, this investment is the return in, on their investment in terms of outcomes and the value of a, a private education. And there's studies out there that you can look at. Um, there's one by the National Education uh, Longitudinal Study that indicates that students who attend private school were twice as likely to earn a bachelor's degree by the time that they were in their mid-20s versus those that attended a school that wasn't a private school. There's a study by the Council for American Private Education that states that 64% of graduates from private schools go on to a four-year college versus 40% from public schools and 37% from charter schools. And uh, Flint Hill is actually at 100%, so all of our students do go on to, to go to college. Um, and then there's also, the when thinking about the, the investment, the true financial return on investment might be, for you, might be what your child can earn in the future. And there's plenty of studies out there that show that students with bachelor's degrees and, and certainly those that go on to attend graduate programs um, end up making, on average, average about uh, two and a quarter million dollars more um, in their lifetime just in salary. Um, that's not even considering how they're investing their salaries um, in the future. And then, of course, there's so much more um, to, to life than, than income. Um, and so we are really looking at um, all the ways that a private education leads to a fulfilling life. And honestly, even more than the income and the jobs and their career, um, that's why a lot of families enroll in private education and enroll at Flint Hill. It's very much more about the, the journey um, of being in a private education and what that is like for a child to experience. Um, for example, thinking about teachers in classrooms, private school teachers have flexibility in, in how and what they teach. They don't have the, the pressures of the mandatory testing. So they're really able to focus on real world application, really able to, to focus on the, the process um, and where the students are in the process. Um, students are encouraged to really challenge themselves and support each other in reaching their fullest potential in private schools. And this really leads to a profound understanding of, of the subjects that they're, they're looking at. On average, private school classes are a lot smaller. And that's not, of course, we, we all know there's so many benefits to, to the children in the classroom of those, those smaller classes, uh, but it's also better for the educators. The educators are able to enjoy more autonomy and they can pay attention to the development and individual challenges of every student, which is also really rewarding for, for the teachers that are working with them. 
Private schools tend to be child directed. So children are able to engage in their interest and pursue their curiosities, um, which is a really important word here at Flint Hill, curiosity, um, which helps them discover their, their true grits and their true talents. Um, this is crucial for choosing the right education and career path for them later in life. Uh, it also promotes a better life satisfaction for children during school and continues to play a part um, of who they grow into in adulthood. So, you know, much like the self-directed classroom, when children are, are choosing in, in school and then in life, according to the, their interests, they end up in a, in a career that they love and, and are more satisfied by that. Flexibility is another thing to consider about private schools who are, are often smaller and they have private funding and they're able to be more nimble and flexible with their own funding in order to keep critical programs in place. Um, they can be nimble in making decisions that are best for their community in unexpected circumstances like pandemics we've all recently learned. Um, Something else is a character and, and values. Private schools are really known uh, uh, for character development. So um, private education is, is founded on a strong sense of values. And these values help children to form lifelong friendships with their, their schoolmates. It also fosters healthy relationships between parents, teachers, and students that lead to a general feeling of well-being and facilitates learning in an organic manner when those partnerships are, are really strong and everybody is founded and grounded in the, the same consistent values. Also, um, community private schools similarly offer strong parent partnerships, which leads to strong parent participation, um, which brings all of the community together participating in the school, um, which equals a community all equally committed to, to success. And so um, that ends up helping children and also parents feel really connected through a support network. Many parents share with us that they really feel joy when they drop their kids off here at Flint Hill because they know their kids have found their community and the parents have actually found their people here too. It's a, it's a big part of, of their life and, and who they are. And overall, private schools provide an avenue to be accountable and explore talents, interests, build relationships, and these continue into to college for rewarding careers. And the value of private education um, ultimately creates a foundation for a f fulfilling life, if you think about it in, in all the ways that we just mentioned. And so when looking at a private school that's the right match for your child um, and th thus have the, the most value for you, um, you'll want to get a feel for the school's ethos, their educational philosophy, their mission, their values, their personality. Um, to describe a little bit about what Flint Hill's ethos is, um, we at, at Flint Hill, we imagine what's impossible. We never rest on our laurels. We're endlessly curious. I, I mentioned that being an important word here. Um, we're endlessly curious, which leads to openness, making connections, expanding horizons. We are driven to constantly evolve, always anticipating our ever-changing world and leading the way towards innovative solutions and shape tomorrow. We champion positive change and we seek creative solutions, striving to deliver excellence in all we do um, to, to better the world around us. We believe that education fueled by a personal interest motivates self-directed inquiry and fosters a lifelong love of learning. We encourage each other to excel to their fullest potential and courage, courageously take on meaningful risks backed by the confidence of self-knowledge. And um, one of the things that we mentioned in the, the navigating webinar that's really fun is to, um, if you're looking at different schools, to, to think about who they might be if they were a person. And um, you really want to, uh, you could ask an admissions team member, if your school was a person, how would you describe their, their personality? And the answer to that here at Flint Hill is inventive, curious, courageous, supportive, inclusive, intentional. And then in terms of value, culture, community, um, Flint Hill is the school, always curious, always 
innovating. Um, Flint Hill unleashes each student's potential to make a meaningful impact on the world. We inspire our students to think without limits, and we understand that each child is truly unique. And every way we, we redefine educational excellence and continuously innovate across programs that support the students to excel in wholeness and cultivate their passions. Our students appreciate their own journey, again, back to that, that journey and process, while also developing the confidence to, to blaze their own trail here. Okay, and before turning it over to Dawn to talk about the, the core values, I'll just um, mention our, our mission. If you go to our website, you'll see our mission. And as you're looking at private institutions, you'll of course wanna see if their mission is something that you can support. When we're making admissions decisions, we're keeping the child, of course, in the center of all of our decisions, along with our mission and, and what we're able to, to provide. And uh, here at Flint Hill, we focus on the learner with the context of strong relationships. We create developmental experiences that embrace the best practices of traditional and contemporary education. Through a continuous growth, we actively and thoughtfully implement the ideas and resources that help each child investigate, create, and communicate collaboratively and effectively in a rapidly changing interconnected world. And then finally, I'll mention our vision before turning it over to Dawn. And you've heard these pieces and some of the things that I've said, but our vision for every student is to take meaningful risk, be yourself and make a difference. And um, Dawn, I'll turn it over to you to, to go into a bit more to each of our core values. Absolutely. And, you know, we believe that the partnership between school and home will be the strongest where there's an alignment of those core values. And at Flint Hill, you can see our core values listed right there in the presentation. We, we re the value of respect, we respect and value all equally. We see each and every one as an individual and value the relationships over all else. We fundamentally believe that our individual existence and our world at large are enhanced through difference. Respecting, valuing ourselves translates to self-advocacy and respecting and valuing others fosters a better and more equitable world. Uh, we believe in leading and support with compassion. At the heart of a good leader is, is compassionate service to others. We value collaboration, teamwork, supporting one another. We celebrate individual strengths and nurture, and, and, and nurture each other's growth. The Husky way is there's no there's no race that's ever won until we cross that finish line together. We are we're, we're a team and we are we are working together. Um, we we value that acting with integrity, being responsible for ourselves and our actions, our impact on others. It means being honest, principled and ethical. It means making tough decisions, being a person of character and treating situations and people with fairness and transparency. It means doing the right thing and standing up for what's right. We also believe in taking responsibility for our actions. We strive to be our best selves and make a positive impact on our world, valuing the journey over the destination. We believe that following your passions and contributing to something greater than oneself re results in a meaningful and fulfilling life. You know, Flint Hill is definitely united by our core values. We come together as a community and act with integrity, with mutual respect and compassion and support for each other. Flint Hill's core values are steeped in our culture. They're taught at the early grades and reinforced throughout the learning journey. The values are measures of all we do and, and inspire us to be our best selves each and every day. Um, again, that partnership in, in that alignment of values is critical to um, that success between home and school. Great. Thank you. And so I will talk a little bit now about opportunity costs. So um, a lot of families, again, when they're they're looking at this um, investment and considering private education, uh, a lot of families are thinking, do we do it now or do we do it later? And again, it's going to be a family decision based on, on so many different factors. Um, some families will think we're going to do it later because we want to do it when it's closer to college to really focus on that, that college preparation piece. And a lot of other families will think that it's better to start the investment earlier um, and start their child in a private education earlier because if you start your child at a younger age, it really starts them with the, a firm foundation in those, those values. 
values. Um, they, um, from an early age, they really foster the self-directed learning. Uh, again, to, to get them into a close-knit community with a strong support system earlier in life to, to help foster that, that motivation. Uh, again, there's the, the foundation of safety and security that enables children to take risk and to, to be themselves. So starting them at an earlier age um, and starting them with that foundation of, of safety and, and security uh, at, their, at their school and their, their community. And then um, to allow them to have the, the full impact of early inspiration from bold, creative teachers with advanced degrees. So um, as you can hear, like a lot of families will decide that starting earlier piece um, just for like that, that foundational piece, as we know, um, you know, children when they're, they're younger are really influenced by, by their environments. So it may seem overwhelming. I know that we've talked about so many different things today. Um, we've talked about, you know, all the different ways to, to save and to, to afford and, and whether the, the value um, of, of a private school education is right for, for you and the good fit for your family. And it may be really overwhelming to consider private school when you're on a budget, as most of us are. Um, but if you're committed to the idea, there are certainly resources out there to help. And if you keep your mind on what's really important important to you uh, and check out all your options, then a private school is, is achievable. And if you keep in mind um, uh, your, some of the things that we said today, we hope that we're really, they're really helpful and you do decide to apply, um, then Dawn will, will tell you more about that admission process uh, for those of you that haven't already started and submitted your application. So um, it may be a little bit redundant for you, those of you already well on your way, but for those of you that aren't yet on your way, we want to make sure we, we talk about that a little bit too. So back to you, Dawn. <laughs> So one of the, if you're really looking for a, a general information about navigating that process, remember we do have that navigating the admission process webinar that you can download from our website. So I'm, you know, I'm definitely reference that if you if you haven't participated that or downloaded downloaded that yet. Um, at Flint Hill, our process is it starts out very simply. You're going to start with that online application form. It's a biographical form. It, it really does take about five minutes to, to complete it. You're going to push that, that submit button and you're going to get confirmation back from us that um, sets up an account in our Husky Hub system. And Husky Hub is our, is our community portal. And um, for those applicant families, it becomes this place where you're gonna go and you can see that admission checklist. So you can follow all of the steps in the admission process and it helps you with some of the scheduling and you can see what's complete and what still has to happen. Um, so great resource for you. Now on that checklist, there are gonna be several, several steps to the, the application process. I know Jennifer gave us the sort of a little bit of a timeline earlier, but we're going to want to have uh, current teacher recommendations um, completed. Um, that, that form is available now, but we do recommend that you consider submitting that to the teacher after that first quarter or trimester grades. That still gives us plenty of time to get that in by that January 21st um, application deadline. Uh, we're going to ask for transcripts from your child's current school. And again, um, at, please submit that transcript request form or, or the, the link to, to, to give us uh, permission to request those transcripts. Uh, again, right after that first quarter or, or trimester. So we can get a, a picture of how your student is doing academically this, 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 this current school year in addition to um, the past few school years. Um, you're also going to want to complete that parent questionnaire. And I, I highly recommend that you complete that parent questionnaire prior to um, coming in or, or scheduling that, that virtual parent interview. So you have two options, in person or virtually for that parent interview time. Um, uh, we also ask for a student interview for students um, grades three through um, our students to be part of that interview process from our, our third grade to, to upper school. Um, there are, if you have a student, um, you can certainly talk with your admission counselor about testing, um, that, that optional testing piece for uh, your, uh, your student as well and learn a little bit more about whether that is a, a good option for your family. Jennifer, am I missing any other components of that? 
that process? I don't think so. I think you, I think you covered it. Thank you very and, much. And certainly you, our steps for applying are listed on our website. Um, and along with the, the, the apply now a button and, and great resources for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're all here to help, which is the next part of this next steps. Um, you can call us, email us, schedule a virtual meeting with us, schedule a phone consultation with us, schedule a tour with us, um, attend another event. We have a ton of events coming up, some parent to parent. If you want to meet the parents, if you want um, to, to come to campus and hear from a division director, if you want to log under your computer and hear about um, the school from the headmaster, the division director, if you look at our events page, which you've clearly done, um, that you'll see a listing of both our future events. And as we've mentioned, we have some past recorded events there for you um, ready to watch whenever you're ready to watch them. Um, so we encourage you to use all those resources. We're really um, active on social media. So to get a glimpse inside our classrooms today over at the lower school campus, we have our, our day of play. So we're going to have a lot of great pictures of students using boxes and all sorts of things to build camping sites, which is the, the theme this year. Um, you can go onto our website and, and see that. Um, I'm sure they'll be posted later later today. Um, but you'll also see things that are happening on a, on a typical daily basis in our lower school, our middle school, our upper school, what our teachers are doing, what our students are doing. We um, did a segment last year called Tuesday Tips, was uh, all tips that we believe people in your shoes would like to hear. We uh, got uh, topics from, from prospective families about what would be useful for them. So there's a ton of information and content there. Um, but we're, we're also here as your resources, as I mentioned. If you look at the bottom of your um, screen, there's flinthill.org slash admission dash team. And that is where you can see all of our, our team members and schedule a appointment or phone consultation with them so we can work with you one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's getting the application process started, whether it's moving through the application process. If you have some really specific financial aid questions, I'm your girl. Um, so feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, Jordy works specifically with the middle school. So she will be your person to, to talk to if you uh, have questions about middle school. Dawn works with JK to four and works with Rico, who's five and six. And then we have three upper school officers, Justin, Julie, and Lauren. And then we have two support team members, um, Laura and Sarah, who, who you'll probably also be in touch with throughout your, your admission journey with us. So we hope that you have found this uh, this webinar very useful. Um, we're here to answer your questions. If you have any questions that we have not yet answered, please feel free to, to pop it into the chat there. And we are more than glad to, to answer them today. Um, and then if you think of them later, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, if you think of any later, um, you, you definitely know how to reach us by now. <laughs> Give it just a moment. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Are there any fees associated with the 10 payment plan? I will need to look to see if anything has changed for, for last year. I believe the cost to enroll for this year was $45. So there's a, a fee to enroll in the, the payment plan, and that is for the, um, the the system that we use for that. But there isn't the same um, credit credit card fees. And then there's another question, Jennifer. Do you have a document or website that lists the web addresses of the resources you mentioned, but that were not already shown on the slides? Um, I do have a document um, that lists some of those and we'll share them with the, the follow up from the webinar and then we'll also share the, the webinar recording as well. Any other questions? Feel free to chat them in. Okay. 
Mission accomplished. It looks like we've answered all of your questions, which um, is what we set out to do. So thank you for, for us all uh, reaching our goal today, hopefully during this, this webinar. And we are going to look forward to, to continuing the dialogue. And um, thank you for spending your lunch break with us. And we will talk with all of you very soon. Have a great afternoon and a beautiful weekend.